so karma, what does it mean? I think, you know, it's used in so many in so many parts of the world now. And I think even among Buddhists, it's used really colloquially and really not with much understanding, you know. I think very commonly we think of it as like a big stick that's used to punish us because the view we have of morality is very strongly punishment and reward. But for the Buddha, it's not like that at all. Buddha's view in many ways is fundamentally different from, from certainly other from the materialist philosophies and certainly other religious philosophies. Buddha's got some fundamentally different ideas. So this, this idea of karma, um, first of all, it refers to the law of karma. What we say is the law of karma. Another way of saying it is the law of cause and effect. So cause and effect, there's nothing special. You know, the world talks about cause and effect. We in the Western world, the scientific world, are geniuses at cause and effect. We know that if you put this and this and this together, you'll get that. And when we know, when you learn laws, you can replicate and get the result every time. Well, Buddha talks exactly this way. So what's he talking about then? Not about material things. He's talking about minds and he's talking about happiness and suffering. That's Buddha's expertise. So to understand this then, how this law of karma plays out, how it plays out in minds, we have to understand Buddha's view of the mind. You know, This word is very common, but we have to understand Buddha's view because he's fundamentally different. His model of the mind is very, very different. So first of all, Buddha's saying, and before we even go here, you know, what's the, what the approach we should take to this is, you know, for myself, I never talk about the word belief or faith. I don't just say I have faith in Buddhism. The crucial way to listen to this is, you know, the, the, way, I like the, the way I like to say it is that um, this is my, uh, my working hypothesis. Buddha was this regular guy who became this enlightened being. And everything that's called Buddhism is not something coming from the sky. It's not revealed to him by some superior being. It's not the Buddha's view at all. This information is coming from Buddha's own experience. So we should take that as a given here, you know. So, okay, what Buddha is saying, what he's found from his own experience, is that first of all, mind, which for him is absolutely central in everything, uh, is not physical, first thing. We take that as our view. Second, it does not come from a creator and, or from a parent, which is quite a shock to us because, you know, whether we're materialists or religious, we, we have the same view that someone else made us. Well, in Buddhism, there's no concept like that. And probably the simplest way to say it is that for the Buddha, you know, we, we make ourselves. Or as Lama Zoba puts it, you know, the, everything comes from the mind. And really to get our head around these terms first is the only way we can begin to put together Buddha's incredible view about what causes happiness and what causes suffering. And not just that, but what causes the universe, in fact. Because for Buddha, mind really is central. So it's not physical, doesn't come from a creator, doesn't come from mummy, daddy, and doesn't come from nothing. So for him, it's, this, it's, it's, it's referring to our thoughts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, whatever you want to use, the entire contents of our inner being. The way Buddha would you know, refer to, um, the way he uses the word mind is in a much more subjective kind of experiential way, referring to all of our feelings and thoughts and emotions, like I said, as well as intellect, unconscious, subconscious. So this is known as mind for the Buddha. But another way of using the word mind is very tasty. You know, Buddha talks about a mental continuum. If you think about it, our mind for the Buddha is like a river of mental moments. So that means in a simple sense, all my thoughts and feelings of today come from thoughts and feelings of yesterday. And I can track them back to the day before and I can track them back to the day before. And we all know if we had perfect memory, we could, we could track them back in an unbroken chain of mental moments and we'd get back where? We'd get back to the first second we popped out of our mummy's womb. But if we keep tracking back, we'd get back to the first second of conception. So, you know, we've got the body, no argument there. We know very well the first second of conception when the egg and sperm came together. But, you know, for the Buddha, there's this other part of us called our mind or our consciousness, this river of mental moments that is the container, if you like, of all, like I said, our thoughts, feelings, emotions, all our good stuff, our psychosis, our love, our compassion, you name it. So the crucial point that Buddha's making about this mind of ours is that, it does, like I said, doesn't come from parents, doesn't come from God, a superior being, which is quite a shock to us because these are the main views we have. So the Buddha's idea then is that right back at the first second of conception, you know, we have to ask the question, well, where was, where was my body the second before that? Well, we know that was the egg and sperm in our mummy and daddy's bodies. So the question is, where did my mind come from? Well, simply a previous moment before that. And where did that moment come from? A moment before that. And Buddha would say, you track it back a few, a few weeks and you're going to find that this, this continuity of river of mental moments, this continuity of consciousness, the word mind is used synonymously with consciousness by the Buddha, generally speaking, you're going to find that it was in a previous body. And then you're going to find it was before that, before that, before that. So when one studies the Buddha's view more deeply, we're going to find that we're going to be able to look into how the Buddha would say, and this fits with his philosophy, this law of cause and effect, that this consciousness of ours is a beginningless continuity of mental moments, you know.
And equally too for the Buddha, it's an endless one. It's certainly the Mahayana view. This consciousness of ours doesn't need creating. I mean, we have this strong sense, well, where did I come from? Who made me? Well, Buddha says, what a silly idea. You don't need making. You don't need have to come from anybody else, you know? So this idea in the Buddhism is actually massive. This idea of mind being our own being is 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 absolutely kind of underpins all of Buddha's views about, about happiness, about suffering, about the universe itself. So just to take it on board intellectually is the first step we have to do. Of course, as we study more deeply, we can go into what Buddha says, you know, and look into it ourselves and try to see the logic of it, at least in, in, uh, initially, at least intellectually. So, okay, uh, we've got this mind. So then Buddha would say there are trillions of mind possessors. The term in Tibetan, Sem Chen, which we translate in English as sentient being, is for Tibetans a lovely, a lovely translation, a, a mind possessor. And for the Buddha, there are trillions of mind possessors, not just humans, we're just a tiny percentage, you know. For the Buddha, uh, you've got animals, we've got creatures that we see, but we have many other types of sentient beings as well for the Buddha. That's his observation, you know, the ones that we can't see. Or as he would call them, different realms of sentient beings. So the fundamental idea about karma then, which is this law that plays out in all sentient beings' minds, which is the law that determines what happens to sentient beings, is that every millisecond of what I'm thinking and you know, what I'm experiencing now for the Buddha, and this follows for all sentient beings, is necessarily the fruit of seeds that I've planted in my mind in the past. Necessarily, every microsecond. And equally, every microsecond of what I think and, the, and also do and say right now, and we'll go into this in a moment, is necessarily planting seeds, or if you like, programming our mind, our consciousness, and these seeds, when they meet the right conditions in the future, and the whole thing is actually quite complex, and but it's all there in the literature over the centuries to be studied by us, if we wish to, that it produces, it will ripen in the future as our future experiences. So real sense, you could say, the Buddha says we create ourselves, and it's not, it's not kind of kidding. But it's a shock to us because there's no view like this. You know, all the religious views um, are this view that we're the product of a superior being and therefore we have faith in a superior being because he runs the show, you know. He creates me, he creates the laws of morality and is to be obeyed. And I'm not complaining about that, but that's fundamentally different from the Buddha's view. And equally, the materialist view. Like I said, you know, we've got the same concept. Mummy and Daddy made me. I mean, you know, you go to your therapist and where do they start looking for the causes of your happiness and suffering? Mummy, daddy, past, what happened here, what happened there, you know? But this is not the Buddhist approach at all. Doesn't mean they didn't play a role. Sure, they played a massive role. But the crucial point for the Buddha is that what goes on in our mind every millisecond is the main cause, certainly for the future, you know, of all my experiences. And this takes time for us to get our heads around, you know? It's, it's, it's really quite a shocking concept, actually. So one of our first Responses to this is, is guilt and shame and blame. Oh, you mean it's my fault, we'll say? And that's very much coming from this dualistic view we have, which is expressed in our, the other philosophies, of the, this idea of blame and punishment and reward. But there's no view like this in Buddhism. There's no concept. And this really takes time to think about because it is, it, naturally we run to this blame mode, you know? Because you look at how we feel. When, when things go wrong, you know, we think, well, excuse me, it's not my fault. I didn't ask to get born. I mean, this is so deeply ingrained in us, isn't, isn't it? It's because we assume that I'm the product of somebody else's handiwork. And Buddha is saying, absolutely not. We're the product of our own handiwork, which is such an incredible idea. And even before we go more deeply into understanding past karma and how it produces our present, I think just the, to really get the taste of the experiential implication of this, it demands that we grow up. It demands that I become accountable, that I'm the boss, you know. And I think that's a really powerful point. It sounds kind of silly to say I'm the boss, not Buddha, but it really is true. We are the boss. And so even taking on board roughly, just as our hypothesis, like I said, this idea that I'm the product of my own past, all the good and the bad, all the happiness and all the suffering, it gives me some kind of courage, you know, because if I'm the product, if what I'm experiencing now is the fruit of what I've done before, that means I can change. I can change and I can produce my future experiences rather than this instinctive view we all have which we think is truth that somehow no one knows what's going on and whether whether like I said the product of somebody else's handiwork and therefore the you know the victim of blame and reward nothing like that in Buddhism okay so the, the basis the basic the kind of nuts and bolts of karma how to understand how that this law works like I said it's a law and it's a natural law you know like gravity like botany it just occurs and Buddha didn't make it up it wasn't revealed to him. It's not speculative, you know. The, 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 the nuts and bolts of it, let's look at it. Let's break it down a bit, you know. So first of all, we could say 
um, that one way, and I really like to talk, this is, there's many ways of talking about karma, but I really like this particular one. It's very helpful. And this is also coming from Lama Zobrimache, how he's talking about it, is that every microsecond of what I'm experiencing, we can divide it into four ways that our karma has, from the past, our karma has ripened. Oh, by the way, it's really important to understand also the meaning of the word quite literally. Uh, it's actually, and this really gives us an insight into the understanding of karma, how it plays out in minds. But the literal translation, you could say, of karma is the word intention. It's actually a mental state. So the main thing about karma is or it's often known as action. So we've got a mental action, and this is what Buddha is saying is the basis of everything. Of course, we have verbal and physical actions, and these, are, these, play, these play a crucial role in the workings of karma. But the actual main thing is intention, or the word volition, or the word will. And these are happening every millisecond. So, okay, so the, you could say that the past, and they use this, this analogy of seeds and fruits quite a lot, you know, which is very helpful, that our past seeds, and remember every millisecond of what we think and do and say, underpinned by what we think is sowing seeds or programming our mind. So the past seeds that we, 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 we planted ripen necessarily in the present in four main ways. Well the first one, and there's different terms for this, but the one, um, this common one is the fully ripened result, which is the type of rebirth we have. So this, you know, as I mentioned before briefly, Buddha is suggesting a whole spectrum of possibilities of types of rebirth. We've got human, animal, there are spirits, there are God realms, all kinds of states of mental states, basically. They're all psychological states that have a certain level of physicality, like we do. And they're all the product of those sentient beings' own past actions. They're not sent there by somebody, you know. So every sentient being necessarily then at the time of death, and it's, it's described in great detail in, in, the, in the Buddhist literature, the death process, that it's, and especially at death, various things occur that, innate, that, that activate a particular powerful karmic seed um, and various conditions apply. Um, that is the one that would ripen, is, they call that the throwing karma. That then when, we, when the mind leaves the body, um, it, it basically programs the consciousness and causes our consciousness, causes our mind to go to a particular rebirth. Well, you know, in our case, we're human, for example. Well, you know, alone, just this point alone for the Buddha, if we really realized how hard we must have worked in morality and goodness and generosity and spiritual practice, and as Lama Zopa says, probably in the context of a, um, keeping vows of morality, just to produce this life we have of being a decent human being with access to goodness and kindness, a wish to practice a spiritual path. It's unbelievable. This is mind-blowing. The Buddha would say we can't imagine how hard we must have worked just to cause this virtuous karmic seed to ripen at the time of our last death, not more than a few weeks before this you know, conception in our present mother's human womb, that then programmed our consciousness that found it, that caused it to go very consciously, not consciously, but in a very direct way to present mother's womb. Well, that's the first way our karma has ripened, the fully ripened result, the type of rebirth we have. And in our case, like I said, human and the result of morality karma. So then the next way karma ripens is it's called, there's different terms for this, but one of them is called experiences, similar to the cause. And this starts with even the parents we get. It's not a random event that we ran to that mother's womb, you know. I mean, the karma was very powerfully determined, even before we stopped breathing in the past life, that I got this particular mother lying in bed with my daddy. There they were in, a, you know, 1944, about May or something. I was, you know, con must have conceived about then. My mother and father lying in bed together. My consciousness runs in there, you know. So the, the second way the karma ripens, like I said, is called experiences. And that starts with the parents. So in my case, born in Australia to mummy and daddy, you know, I was a second child. So the experience is similar to the cause. The word experiences is meaning all the way you're seen and treated by whoever's in your life. And that starts with your family, you know, my family in Melbourne, in Australia, then the, the neighbours, my siblings, the next door people, the nuns who taught me, all the way up until this moment, I'm seen and treated by other beings, animals, humans, the works, you know. So the fundamental law of karma, one of the fundamental laws, is that anything that we label happiness, let's say in terms of experiences, good parents, nah, you know, good siblings, kind this, lucky this, happy this, whatever, the way we're seen and treated by others, if it's called happy, then this is the fruit of virtue in relation to those sentient beings. Karma's kind of personal. It's not just a random event. We've got strong history with these people, starting with our parents. 
So if they treat us well, love us, are kind to us, believe our words, if, even if we're lying, but they believe our words, they think we're lovely, they, they, they give things to us, all of this is not a random event. Every single moment of this for the Buddha is the fruit of my past virtue. Then the ones who harm me equally, you know, the harm me, the lie, the ones who cheat me, lie to me, don't, don't like me, abuse me, whatever, and we've all got both experiences. These are necessarily, again, karma's pretty personal, the fruit of my past non-virtue. There's a fundamental law for the Buddha. It's not, it's not punishment, not reward. Because let's face it, punishment and reward imply somebody up there pulling the strings, doesn't it? it? Implies a judge. Not for the Buddha. No such concept. We're the boss, you know. We created these experiences. We've got strong personal history with these sentient beings. So the third way our karma ripens, and the second way in this life, this is referring to all the tendencies, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our characteristics, our personality. And we come program with all this from the first second of conception. And this is a shock to us. They do, not one of my personality traits, whether I'm good at music, good at football, loving, kind, psychotic, compassionate, they do not come from my parents. I might share them with my parents, but they've got them because they did them before, and this is this one. I've got them because I've done them before. They're basically a bunch of habits. So Buddha says, I'm completely responsible for whatever's inside me, you know. These are the third way that karma ripens. And one way of calling this is actions similar to the cause. The way you act, the way you think, the way you feel, all the tendencies you have. Like I said, whether it's good at music or football or spiritual practice or a liar or a thief. These tendencies. The fourth way is called environmental karma. So this is the physical world we occupy, not just the trees and the moon and the stars. You know, you might live in an ugly place where it's dirty, where you live in a war zone, you live in a beautiful house, you live in a lovely place where the food is delicious. All of this is called environmental karma. So this is the point about Buddha. It's kind of outrageous, you know, that every single millisecond of our experiences, all the environment, all the people and sentient beings we meet, how they treat us, how they see us, all our own tendencies and our own humanity. Main cause, my past actions. So it's kind of intense, but how marvelous. For me, this is incredible. And Buddha's just, just not saying it's karma. You know, the literature over the centuries is vast for anybody who wants to study it. And all of this is coming from Buddha's own experience. Of course, you don't believe him, like you wouldn't believe Einstein on the first listening. But you, you've got to check up that he's a valid person, don't you? And then you listen, you step back and you listen to what he says. And then what you do in your practicing, taking on board this idea that this is from Buddha's own experiences, you listen carefully, you use your own intelligence, you use your noggin, and you think it through. And what you're doing, and this is what practice is, by listening and thinking and analysing it and then meditating on it, what you're doing is two things. You're experiencing the truth of it for yourself, or the, you're experiencing it and you're verifying it. And as His Holiness the Dalai Lama often says to us Westerners, if you study and take on board and try to practice what Buddha says, seriously, his steps, because let's face it, Buddhism is just Buddha's methodology, what he did to get to where he got to. If we do that and we get to a certain point and we discover that what he says will happen doesn't, then Buddha is wrong and we must reject him. This is the correct approach to Buddhism, not just kind of believing it because it sounds nice, you know, which means you've got to engage in it. It's serious. So, okay, then the Buddha is saying, and this is expressed very nicely in the Four Noble Truths, that in the, in the First Noble Truth, in the Second Noble Truth, Buddha lays down the context, the reference point for the Four Noble Truths is suffering. And so the Second Noble Truth lays down the two main causes of suffering. And we can extrapolate there and say the two main causes of happiness come down to the same thing, both in myself, past karma, intentional action that's followed through by the servants of my mind, let's face it, which is my body and speech, that leaves a seed in my mind. If it's a virtuous one, it'll leave a seed in my mind that will necessarily ripen as my happiness any of those four ways, type of rebirth, tendency, experience, environmental. And if it's a negative action, it'll ripen as suffering. This is a fundamental law, like a natural law, like I'm saying, you know, a natural law. So, um, okay, so then the, the, the approach to this view of karma, being a Buddhist, is that, well, okay, good, I don't want suffering. I mean, it's pretty fundamental. No, you don't have to sort of, you know, you can just observe the behavior of dogs, of humans. You're going to deduce pretty quickly that they don't want suffering and they do want happiness. And Buddha would say this, that we're driven, every sentient being is driven by the wish not to suffer, and by the wish to be happy. And all Buddha's laying out in his Four Noble Truths is his own findings from his own direct experience, which is stated in the Third Noble Truth, that every single sentient being just naturally possesses the potential to be free of suffering. You know, So if this is true, how marvellous, what a great idea. I'd love to be free of suffering. Flip that over, that's called full of happiness. 
So if I want to be free of suffering, I better know what suffering is. And that's the first noble truth. And that, but crucially, I better know what causes it. So the Buddha's putting me right in the center of responsibility. Like I'm saying, you know, that there are two main causes of suffering. Thousands of causes, like anything. You know, you want to make a cup. You know, you had to write all the things down that I needed to get a cup. You're going to have pages of instructions. So there are many, many causes that come together to produce anything. It's the same with a moment of happiness or suffering. But Buddha narrows it down to two main ones. And the two main ones are the ones that he says, if I work on those, they're the ones, because they're main, I can change everything, you know. So the two main ones, shockingly enough for us, which is the point here, they're inside me. And this goes for happiness as well. And this is an interesting point, you know, because we're such addicts to guilt and, and blame. We, we never think, we always think about karma in terms of bad things, don't we? Why do bad things happen to me, we ask, you know? But we never say, why do good things happen to me? Well, for the Buddha, same reasoning. You caused it, sweetheart, you know? So we want happiness and we don't want suffering. Pretty basic. So if I'm taking on Buddha's view as my hypothesis, then I better know what suffering is and then I better know what causes it. Pretty practical. And the fourth step, the fourth noble truth is what you do. To, to get this, you know, to get this amazing result that Buddha calls freedom from suffering, you know. Well, this word nirvana, we love this word nirvana, you know, we throw it around like we throw around the word karma. Nirvana actually is, is not some nice place like heaven, but it's actually, even speaking very simply, we can say that nirvana is the name you give to the state of being, you could say this, of the person who's followed Buddha's methodology, who's looked at what suffering is, who's understood the causes of it, and is through this enormous hard work of, of you know, following the steps in the Buddha's path, learning to completely eradicate from the mind um, all, the, all, the, all the causes of suffering and therefore the suffering itself. And so you've got like your own freedom, which is the nirvana of your own liberation from suffering, which in, and, and then you, but you've also got in the Mahayana, you've got the, the, the more long term goal, the more marvelous goal of um, full enlightenment or this complete nirvana or what Buddha would they refer to as Buddhahood, actually. And so, you know, the context here is, of course, the Mahayana, which is the, the goal of Buddhahood. So there's a lovely analogy Buddha uses, and I like it a lot, that a bird needs two, needs two wings wisdom and compassion. So karma fits into the wisdom wing, which is all the work we do to work on our mind, control our body, control our speech, and then to control our mind so we can do this job of achieving our own liberation. But we add to that mix the compassion wing because now we're qualified to help others do the same, which is the sort of long-term goal, you know. But, but the Buddha's view is that, you know, this idea of freedom from suffering, that's some abstract idea. And this we can't talk about it now, but the, when we understand the nature of mind and the nature of what these neuroses are that cause this suffering, because we haven't begun to talk, look into this, then we really can see how it's logical that we can achieve this result, which is a psychological result, is what we're talking about, you know. So Buddha's view, the third noble truth is he is saying from his own findings we can achieve this result of liberation from suffering. We need to know what suffering is, which is the first noble truth, but the crucial one here we're discussing is the causes of suffering. So the two main causes, past karma, like I said, which means intentional action that leaves the seed in the mind, propelled by a delusion, motivated by a neurosis. So to understand this, we should just even briefly understand what the contents of the mind, Buddha's model of the mind, because this is kind of crucial to understand. So we've got, in the Buddha's model, you could say quite simply, you know, and it's deceptively simple, We've got, the Buddha says there are basically the three categories of contents in our mind. This is a very different model from the way we think in the West. You know, we're not talking brain, remember? We've got positive states of mind, negative states of mind, and neutral. And these are not moralistic terms. These are technical terms. So po positive states of mind are actually, for the Buddha, and this is one of his major findings, are at the core of our being. They are indestructibly in the, in, 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 uh, the, in the very nature of, what, of our mind. When the mind is fully developed, when the mind has achieved nirvana, it's fully developed in the goodness, you know? And the negative ones, and this is a big shock to us, and this is the fundamental point of Buddha, that he says they're adventitious, which means they're not at the core of our being. They're not integral to who we are. And this is a huge point, and one needs to study Buddhist literature, you know, in the Buddhist literature in more detail to really see the logic of this. But basically, these are the neuroses we're all so familiar with. So there's like a hierarchy of these neuroses in the mind. And this is the job of being a Buddhist, first controlling your body and speech and stopping creating negative karma, because you will, it will cause you suffering. But then learning to get to the root of it, as Lama Yeshi would say, to become our own therapist by using meditation to really go deeply into our mind to uproot these neuroses, uproot these delusions. So there's this hierarchy of them. And the root one 
is this known, known colloquially as ego grasping. And it's the main delusion on the basis of that. And this is a strong, this strong neurotic sense of self that Buddha says we have, which is completely mistaken, that then gives rise to its main voice, which is attachment. This bottomless pit of dissatisfaction, which gives rise to neediness, which is completely, new, uh, is like a, like a, like a junkie, basically, that is, runs us every single second, is desperate to get what it wants. The second this attachment doesn't get what it wants or is thwarted, then this gives rise to aversion, anger, or guilt and fear and all this business we have. Then the other variations, that, you know, the jealousy and the, 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 the neurosis, and the, I mean, the low self-esteem, the pride, all these states of mind. For the Buddha, these are the main cause of our suffering because they propel us to do the actions with our body and speech, which are the actions that are called immoral, which are the ones that harm others, and which therefore harm ourselves. And so the, the first job in Buddhism, like junior school, in the first scope of practice, is to refrain from doing negative actions because they will harm you. Because everything we think and do and say for the Buddha brings consequences to me. Then the more advanced level of practice is when we now start to look into the mind, use meditation, go more deeply, unpack and unravel our minds and deconstruct this rubbish and rid the mind eventually of these neuroses, which is what leads us to our own liberation. So one more component that's really crucial to understand, to try to pack out karma properly and understanding how all this process works. The, what, the fundamental instruction Buddha is giving right at the early stages of practice is to refrain from negative actions. Not because he said so, which is our typical Christian or Muslim view, but because they will cause me suffering. Why? Because a negative action in its nature is one that harms another, but it's negative for me when I do it because it's informed by a neurosis, which is what pollutes my mind. So the very first level of practice is don't harm others. And then the other crucial piece to add to our practice is we call it purification, which means it's not enough just not to do more harm. That's wonderful. Not to sow more negative seeds, but I've got to pull out the weeds I've already planted. And of course, the logic is I've planted countless seeds in countless past lives. And this is purification. And as Lama Zabrimache says, we're insane not to do this practice every day. And basically, it's, again, a psychological process. As Lama Yeshi says, you know, we create negativity with our minds. So we can transform them. We can purify them by creating positivity with our minds. And so, the, so a, a basic day of practice, right at the first stages, without getting too advanced, control your body, control your speech, live in vows, don't harm, don't kill, don't lie, don't bad mouth thus protecting yourself from creating more negative karma and at the end of the day you do the purification practice so you regret the harm you've done which is not guilt but is acknowledging I did this did that said this because and you regret it because you don't want the suffering results it's like compassion for yourself then you rely upon a decent doctor the Buddha whose methods you can use and then you have compassion for those you harmed then you do some kind of practice to purify and then the crucial step the fourth one you determine not to do it again so this this fundamental practice of controlling your body, speech and mind in day-to-day -day life and purifying all the countless seeds we've planted in the past, this helps us get ahead of the game, you know. And this is the main, the basic kind of junior school and high school level of practice, not even talking yet about the compassion wing, but this, this is the basis of a good practice.